Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today we are talking about Existentially Challenged, the new audiobook by Yahtzee Croshaw. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Yahtzee is a, uh, internet game reviewer who also does a few different things like game design and writing. Um, I've always really enjoyed his work, and I really liked his book, Differently Morphous. I also kind of like Mog World. I started listening to that recently. Uh, I mean to read, save, we'll save the galaxy for food and we'll destroy the galaxy for food, but I haven't gotten around to those yet. But, um, all in all, I really like this book. I'm just going to come out and say it. I think it's a better, an improvement over his original. So for those of you who don't know, this is a sequel to his book, Differently Morphous. And the basic premise of those books are it's a parody of the sort of secret world magic books, you know, where magic is like the secret world and there's a government organization tasked with keeping it separate from the rest of the world. In the first book, early on, magic got revealed to everyone. So there are these beings that end up being called fluidics, um... I can explain the magic system later in the spoiler talk, but long story short, they were trying to immigrate to Earth, but the Ministry the ministry of Occultism kept killing them on sight because they looked like shock ops from H.P. Lovecraft's uh, books. Uh, and the public, you know, ends up coming on their sides like, uh, the government's been murdering intelligent creatures who have just been trying to run, run away from their horrible world towers. That's horrible and atrocious. It's like, yeah, it was. And they're a very outdated uh, organization with a bunch of old idiots in charge. Well, with someone named Elizabeth in charge and the old idiots get to pretend they have a say in things. Uh, and she's been trying to reform the organization for years. And when they're exposed, they're like, all right, look, we need to completely rebrand. So we're going to use them as scapegoats. You're going to take a few people who can actually trust and we're going to, you know, build this place. We're following a um, normal human, actually, or as normal as it can be. So basically her name's Allison. She was in the magic uh, wizard school at first. But she never advanced it to power, and they eventually got one of their mages who can see the magical aura of people to come in and be like, uh, yeah, it looks like you don't have a magical power, so we're going to have to figure out what to do with you. Apparently, they were suspicious because she's gotten 100% on every test she's ever taken because she has an identity memory. It's like, yeah, we just kind of picked you up by mistake. We thought you had telepathy. Uh, <laughs> our bad. We apologize. Which I really like. Uh, she's fun. I, I kind of enjoy just how, like, she's like, I just want to help. Uh, I'll, I'll go with anything. Anything at all. I just don't want to go back to my parents. They're kind of the worst. Uh, <laughs> all in all, she's fun. Uh, she gets, so the head of the organization, um, Elizabeth, pairs her up with this suspicious guy she's been investigating for years who has, like, a 100% uh, success ratio, but he is very, very shady. His name is Dr. Diablery. And he talks like a gothic Victorian villain. Uh, and it's hilarious. I love him. He's just constantly a riot. Um, he's clearly shady. He clearly knows more than what's going on. He has strange runes that he really shouldn't have access to. And Allison basically is put in charge of keeping an eye on him because of her identity memory. She'll be able to catch anything odd that happens. Uh, magic is exposed halfway through. <clears throat> And the uh, Fluidics, who were originally called Shawgoths, which is a really fun reference. I really like this. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, H.P. Lovecraft term... Uh, the Shawgoth is from H.P. Lovecraft's work. They're basically giant blob monsters that devour, that devour flesh. Like, you know, think like the blob and stuff like that. But what's really funny is that Shawgoth becomes like the new the new racial slur, essentially, because it was used by the, you know, hunters who were like killing them in the street killing them whenever they came in. So everybody's like, oh, how dare you call them that? Um, there's a lot of meh, um, okay-ish political jabs about political correctness on both sides of the argument. You know, those who are like completely against it and those who are over the top about it are both portrayed as a little a-holes, a little bit a-holes. But honestly, it's probably the least interesting part of the book. Like, it's the main metaphor, but I just don't think those kind of metaphors work well when you post it onto magic systems where the magical creatures are, you know, genuinely different from other human beings because the whole point of those is usually that everybody's the same. Why can't we all just get along? It's all right. They don't lean into it as heavily in the second one, which is nice. Anyway, there's a big stuff. Uh, Allison has to find out who's killing the fluidics. 
Uh, I really like the Shawgoth world, though, because H.P. Lovecraft was notoriously racist, so become, having one of his, uh, cre- the name of one of his creations become a racial slur is just kind of, like, very appropriate. Uh, like, it makes a lot of sense. I can totally see why that'd be, a, like, why that would happen. Anyway, we have, a, like, a lot of fun characters. We have the, uh, magic, uh, the, the guy who has the, sees the magic auras, uh, him along with a pyrokinetic or, like, the duo team of, uh, you know, the agency's, like, top mage duo. And all the mages are created by, like, all of crafting entities from another realm. Bits of their magic comes into our realm, and when it infests a human when they're really, really young, they gain magic powers, but if they're not trained how to, uh, control their powers, then they can be taken over by the entity and basically turn into monsters. But eventually it's like, yeah, but not... Okay, so... How, and so basically there's this whole moment where they show like Elizabeth's like how di- Elizabeth's getting chewed out for having like this school where they're constantly trying to keep the students in line. It's very militaristic and it's like, oh, you're basically brainwashing them. We're teaching them control so they don't become like this thing. And he shows them one of the uh, characters who's been possessed. And it turns out the uh, ancient that possessed him was completely cool. Like it wasn't out to murder anyone. It just wanted to kind of enjoy work. You just kind of wanted to be like, okay, we're just fine now. Like, I have tentacles coming out of my head, but I'm cool. I just want to see a movie. Uh, <laughs> which was interesting. And so Elizabeth's like, I've seen how dangerous these things can be. It's like, okay, fine. You're the expert here. How many ancients do you have actual, confirmed reason to believe are out to kill us? One. We've encountered one. It's like... Yeah, when you say it like that, like, like, don't get me wrong, the ancient, like, nearly destroyed the entire country when it tried to manifest to here and cause massive destruction and madness, as we learned in the second book. But at the same time, one entity is not a, you know, accurate representation of the whole. That's fair. Um, you know, that's not to say some of the ancients aren't complete monsters and they don't seem to really understand humanity, like... There are beings far beyond us, like the Elder Gods of Lovecraft's work. Actually, there's a lot of Lovecraftian horror elements to this tinged in the background of the comedy, which is really interesting. I really like it. Um, and it's not so much that most of them, like, most of them don't really care about us, so to speak. Like, the parts that they influence the people they, like, dual consciousness with, um, uh, as it comes to be known, don't really care as much. They're more of, like, ex- weird fusions of the original personality and the desires of the ancient. Whatever, as uncomprehendable as those can be. Most of them, some of them want to cause chaos. Most of them don't really care enough about us to try and kill us all. Like, even the few we encounter that are more villains don't really want to do that. Um, I really like it. It's, it's just interesting. It's an interesting world. It's an interesting magic system in particular. That raises a lot of uh, questions about, you know, what it would be. What, what, you know, what if you had a voice telling you, would you give in to it? Would you say screw it? Um, it's, it's fine. I like the first one fine, but the second one is where it gets interesting. So now that I've explained the premise, I can get to the second one. So I essentially challenge takes place shortly after there's been, um, they find the fluidic killer, they stop them, Allison gets in trouble because she does something really stupid and accidentally causes more collateral damage, and that's what people want to focus on. But that's mostly cooled down, and so, you know, the world has kept going on. The fluidics are integrating well. Um, and the government has finally decided to use magic. So there's a lot of push for, you know, people who are, like, appropriating magic, essentially, to stop doing it. And the government sees their opportunity. They're like, oh, wait, now that magic is real, we can define what is actually real and what isn't and finally go after those faith healers who keep scamming people into giving them their money for cures that don't exist. Um, and so they pass a big bill about the appropriation of magic. It's basically, you can't do something that would be defined, that could be defined as magic, uh, if you don't actually have proof that you can, you know, use magic. Uh, it's a very vaguely worded bill that the Department of, um, the Ministry of Magic didn't think, uh, didn't think was actually going to happen, or the Department of Extra-Dimensional Affairs, sorry. Uh, didn't think it was going to pass. And there's this big moment at the beginning. It's like, there's no way this is going to pass. Like, it's so vague. It's so dumb. There's, no, no. They're going to rewrite it a few times. They're going to do it again. And we're going to get another bill later on. It's like, oh, it passed. It's like, oh, crud. So they had to create a department of skepticism. And they put Diablo, Di- Dr. Diablery and Allison in charge of it. 
And since Dr. Diablery is himself, no one on Earth wants to be a part of their department. So they're basically two people running an entire department. Um, there are some strange vampire killings. People who've had their life essence sucked out of them by a magic user. And so the evidence is pointing them at a cult called, uh, what was it? The... I'm trying to remember what it was. Miracle Meg's cult? Um, I forget what the name of the cult exactly was, but basically they worship a uh, ancient who is apparently in dual consciousness with a healer. Now, what's interesting is that Yahtzee is, does, is actually pretty clever about his magic systems, and so healers are actually like one of the worst types of mages to be because healers are type of life essence transfer. Life essence transfer basically divides into two types of magic. There's vampirism, which is sucking the life essence out to extend your own and give yourself eternal youth. And then there's uh, healing, which is pushing your own life essence out in order to, you know, uh, heal somebody. The downside is it causes you to age rapidly and then die. Uh, it's like your life is a tank. You use it up as you live. And if you give someone some other, some life, you lose that life. Um, and so healers don't go into dual consciousness usually because ancients aren't good with, you know, the idea of mortal lifespans. And so they'll eat up human life. Um, so if somebody was in dual consciousness with an ancient, uh, whose power manifested in them as a healer, they should already be dead. And healing people should be like visually aging them. But Miracle Meg, the, uh, kid they're saying is a healer, doesn't seem to be aging at all. In fact, she's like 10 years old. So what's going on? Um, now they, they start investigating them and after the cult is determined to be using some type of magic, although there are a lot of odd coincidences that stop them from being able to completely identify it, they, um, have validated it, which means that the cult, uh, is now able to use that to go after the Christian church. Uh, now don't get me wrong, that, that, that seems like it's a complex issue, and they do a few token thing, jabs at the Christian church in general, but they end up uh, having the main conflict between them and one of those, like, really scummy mega church people who, like, say you can, like, faith heal and just praying will hear cancer patients so they convince them not to go to the hospital. Like, it's one of those really, like, fundamentalist evangelical a-holes who nobody cares about, which is very tactful of Yahtzee. It's like, yeah, I could have gotten in trouble if I gone to the Christian church as a whole, but let's just go after this guy. In fact... Uh, there's even this moment where the government has to approve, decides to approve the, um, this like contest later on, like a faith healing contest, because it's not, it's, no, 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 this isn't the Christian church he's going up against. He just, we, we managed to pit him against one of the, one of the branches, one of the groups of Christians, even we don't like. So this is fine. If he gets discredited, he gets discredited. That's fine on us. Uh, and I just love that moment. It's just like, yeah, we're, we're cool with him taking this guy down. People like him were exactly who we made the law to get rid of. Um, which is an interesting idea. It's like, if you could quantify magic, suddenly you could go after all, like, the tarot, you know, the tarot card readers and the fake ex, ex, uh, fake, um, mediums and stuff like that. And that's, like, what the law is like. I could genuinely see, like, if the magic became real, the government starting to really crack down those people now that they had to fend and prove they were bullshit. Uh, it's like, no, 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 we know what actual magic is. You're not doing actual magic. Get the fuck out of here and stop lying to people. Uh, which I, I think it's interesting. Like, this could have been, like, a lot more, eh, Like, it, it could have been a very uncomfortable uh, thing, but the way Yahtzee ends up doing it is a lot better than I originally thought. Like, going into this, when I first heard the, uh, read the description, I was like, oh, is this gonna get uncomfortable? No, no, this is, this is completely fine. Um, and all in all, the mystery plot in particular is actually really good. I really like the twist. Uh, Yahtzee is, like, a reviewer, so he constantly has to bag, badger on about bad writing in video games. And in this game, I can actually see how that's helped him as a writer, because this, this is a, one of the big things with mysteries is a lot of writers will write a mystery in such a way to have just a twist near the end that doesn't make sense and is done in such a way that you can't really piece everything together and have figured it out before the final reveal. 
And Yahtzee is very good about laying it out. I actually figured, I actually guessed at most of the solution to this puzzle before he said it. Now, there are a few misdirections, and there is a bit more to it than I originally thought as I was listening in, but I liked that I was able to mostly figure out the mystery in the same step as the characters and not to wait for the reveal to be like, oh, well, that I didn't have that information. It's like, no, you know, you get all the information to solve this, and the main mystery of, like, the, you know, the secret behind how the cult's doing this, why the bodies are turning up, is very interesting, and that's the main thing I liked of the story. The rest of the comedy surrounds that solid core, which is really good. Really good. All in all, I love it. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have for this as a review. Uh, I'll be getting to the spoiler section after the fact. Uh, but right here, I give this like a 8 out of 10. Yeah. If you like, uh, parodies of fantasy store, urban fantasy, this is probably a good series for you. I'd start with Differently Morphous. It's the weaker of the two, most definitely, but I really like this one. Yeah. Yahtzee definitely improved as a writer since he last uh, worked on this series, and I can't wait to see what the third one. Because, yes, this is definitely going to be a long-running series, I can already tell now. Uh, hopefully we get two, one or, two or three more of these, that would be really fun. But even if we just get one more, that'd be great too. Alright. So, from here on out, there are going to be spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, well, you know what to do. So, what to talk about here? Okay, let's start out first with the, um, you know, the mystery. So what happens in the story is there, uh, first, first up, there's a body that's been drained of its life force near Miracle Meg's, uh, thing. It's found right outside the house. And that's what first gets them to start investigating them and whether or not they're a scam. Um, you have Adam, who's the mage who can see the auras of different magic users, who's been investigating the cult because he's determined to, uh, get away from Victor, who is his partner. They've been separated and are working on different departments. It's causing a little bit of tension with them. Uh, he's very much determined to see this case through. and Everyone else just wants to let it go. But in the end, he ends up kind of being right, but he's also just not that good of a detective, and he admits that later on. Uh, he's like, oh, I want to just go back to working with Adam. I'm, I, 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 this was way too much for me. Mm. Uh, and I like, I like Adam. I like Adam a lot. He's this very, like, puppy dog kind of person. It's like everyone around him just, like, he doesn't know if people actually want him around or if they just kind of want him for his power. Because he has the really useful power of being able to see the aura of magic in people and tell exactly who has what magic power and track down magic beings. And as a result, people have kind of just used him his whole life. Like, you know, he was paired with Victor because Victor is essentially a walking uh, nuclear inferno. And Adam was literally the pointer dog attached to him. Hey, go here. That's where the magic is. Blast that. Uh, so he feels a lot like a pointer figure. And I kind of like that his arc is trying to separate himself from Victor. But figuring out that he doesn't really need to separate himself. He can assert himself in his own ways. Uh, meanwhile, Victor goes through his own identity crisis. Because the uh, it, basically Victor grew up with... is one of the people who supports a lot of the school's practices. Because when he was growing up, the... Um, Ancient in his head was constantly telling him to burn the entire world to ash, and its name was Ifrit. And he ends up running into someone who is in dual consciousness with Ifrit, and is essentially like having to deal with the fact that his ancient is now loose in the world and is kind of just chilling. Occasionally he sets a dumpster on fire, but you know, it's not doing that much problem. Uh, they end up having this back and forth nemesis thing that's really funny, and I just really like it. And the, there's this moment where Adam finds out, like, wait. Do you have a nemesis? We promised that if we ever had a nemesis, it'd be a shared nemesis together. It's like, well, you weren't there. And I had to go find her. It's like, no. Well, I hope you enjoy yourself. Uh, <laughs> the two of them are just a riot. I, I think they pair off each other very well. Um, all in all. And I think that's a really solid core for it. Uh, Adam also does just, is you know, kind of this extra... Uh, view into it. I actually really like the one of the ways that the cult manages to get away with, around for his power. So they find out uh, about his powers before he comes to visit and basically do a breast cancer awareness day because healing magic is pink. And so all the entire room when he walks in for the healing is like coated in pink paint, pink lights. And it's all the same shade of pink as healing magic. So when he tries to look at them to see the aura, he can only see the whole room is already coated in a giant aura of the same pink color. Um, and it's just this really moment of like, oh, so that's how you fool one of them. That's actually very clever. 
Especially since Allison and Dr. Diabl- Diablery already determined there was actual magic going on. Which is interesting. Um, meanwhile, we have Dr. Diablery, who was at, at the end of the first book, Dr. Diablery was revealed to be like a self-constructed, mag- like a magically induced uh, split personality for this mysterious figure who's been infiltrating the, um, you know, Department of Extraventional Affairs and is working on some mysterious agenda with some other people. We find one of the other people he's been working with, another rune user, um, who he engineers scenarios to meet with, at, both as Dr. Diabory and as this mysterious other person. And he's eventually revealed to be one of the people, he's eventually revealed to have a connection with Elizabeth. Uh, she was the assistant to the previous head of the department, and... When the shadow, when the shadow ancient tried to enter our world in this big old event that's referenced a lot in the past, uh, he extracted him and left her there after shooting her in the leg. Uh, and he, she took Mr. Tebot, who was the head of the organization. They ran a lot of dumb code names back then, uh, Elizabeth mentions. And he took him, a few men, and vanished. They apparently stopped the entity from emerging. But when Di- when Diablery was found again, he was calling himself Doctor Diablery, for instance, which wasn't his actual name, and his mo- he was basically completely insane at some level. Although he was still capable of being a soldier for the department, so she kept him on partially to keep an eye on him. All in all, it was a very interesting um, presence. Like learning from Elizabeth the past of the event. You can really get a sense of why she was like, yeah, no, the ancients are complete monsters and I never want to be around any of them ever again. It creeps me the hell out that we're allowing them to, you know, uh, merge with people and I'm very scared that someone's going to go fucking ballistic again. Because the event, the, uh, well, what they, the cover story was an ash cloud over the entire country and it was just this massive shadow and it genuinely seems terrifying. Basically, they grabbed this, uh, person who got possessed and they locked him up like usual, but apparently the Ancient had used him to basically rip open a portal to their world, and shadows started spilling out. They didn't realize anything was wrong until somebody got murdered, and then uh, the head of the department ended up killing one of the other higher-ups Elizabeth worked with because he had gone insane and most likely murdered that first person. They locked down the building, but people started going mad. Nobody knew who to trust. Elizabeth's an- Elizabeth spent the same, basically the whole time locked in her office as the head of the department lo- hold himself up, unwilling to trust anyone. Uh, she was close enough to him, though, to try and talk to him, and she, he gave her some advice. Uh, Dr. Diablery's original personality was one of the field agents who was far enough away to be trusted at the time. Uh, he extracted them, but wouldn't take her with them, even when the head of the department, Mr. Teapot, begged him to. Which, you know... Wasn't great shooting her in the leg and leaving her in her office as monsters literally, as her, you know, colleagues turned into, uh, Lovecraftian monsters and began murdering people and roving bands of the paranoid, uh, some of whom were stoked by those already influenced by the ancient, uh, roamed through the halls killing anyone on principle. Yeah, you get the sense of like, yes, I have very good reason to not like ancients. It's like, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, they murdered basically everyone you ever worked with and left you a hollow shell of your former self. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, all in all, though, she's just very interesting. You also had, oh god, what was her name? Um, Dr. Dr. Vina Amani. And she's like the new, you know, um, social relations thing. She's constantly trying to push for, uh, great representation of like magic users and fluidics and stuff like that. And it's, She's both annoying and also genuinely has some points at times, which makes it all the more annoying when she's trying to push things further than they need to go. Uh, you have, like, the really over-the-top, um, clean things up, make sure the apartment looks good, uh, angry military-style guy. Uh, it's all pretty fun. It's all pretty fun. All the characters have their places. The writing's pretty good on average. I really like how Yahtzee voices everything. Uh, the, like, the dull, the dull tone of voice he uses in a lot of characters, like, yeah, so, we, we went home and, like, everything was just so weird. Like, half the characters sound high all the time. It's hilarious. Oh, 
also my one of my favorite things was so there are some weird vampire murders that don't fit in with the cult's overall plan and it's later revealed that there was this psychic dog and he was declared psychic by a, a hospital because every time he curled up in a patient's uh bed they would end up dead a few days later. Turns out he's a vampire and he was responsible for some of the deaths. And he was originally seen with a group of three teenagers in a van who drive around solving mysteries. Yes, this is a thing that happens. <laughs> Scooby-Doo, but if he was a magic life-sucking vampire. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. I actually really like that twist at the end. It's like, so what were the other vampire murders? I guess it was just like another rogue vampire throwing us off the scent. Oh, it's the dog. And they throw that offhanded psychic dog deaths thing in the background. And I'm like, oh, I could have caught that. I could have caught that right there if I was paying attention. Like, maybe it, it's a pretty well hidden twist. Like, it's not guaranteed that everyone will be able to figure out. But there is enough information to guess at it. Um, and they do bring up magically infused animals regularly throughout the show. I mean, not the show, throughout the book. But uh, moving on, the Miracle Meg cult. The get, the thing there is eventually it's revealed that um, Mi Miracle Meg actually had a sister. A younger sister who would only be about 10 years old. Meanwhile, Miracle Meg herself went through the... Um, went through the thing. And it's eventually revealed that they have like this... Um, Basically, someone who's called Miracle Mom, and they never like show her outright. Like she's always in the background. The dad, who's called who calls himself like Miracle Dad, always tries to you know keep her in the side. And it's eventually revealed she's Meg. Now, what they did was she used to use her powers for her dad uh, as a faith healing thing before they got taken in by the old ministry. And she was told what happened, what happened to her. She had already aged a bunch. And so they had to stop doing the whole miracle faith healing cult. Um, but eventually, once they realized that there were other magic users out there, they basically started tricking healers, uh, with the cult. So they used their cult. They established a cult using Meg and she aged a bit more. Uh, they used her younger sister as the head of the cult, though, the figurehead. And they would, See, the whole thing is healing magic can't be transmitted through over the air. It has to be transmitted through physical surfaces and pretty thin. So they set up a tunnel underneath their house where they have all their things and everyone has to take off their shoes. They would always direct the healer to stand on top of a drain. They even like get this really sick kid. It's really like this really weird scene where they make a sick kid who can barely like stay awake, get out of his wheelchair, take off his shoes and stand on in this very specific spot before they start healing. Uh, it's because you can transmute it through small surfaces or thin uh, drains. And underneath that drain, they would lure in other healers who wanted to figure out a way to use their powers without aging, like Meg is apparently doing. And they bring them to this weird shrine and say, if you go to Elyech, the ancient that she's apparently in dual consciousness with, she'll, if you give her your, your life force, she will give it back to you and show you how to keep it. Um... And so they would, you know, blast all their life force up through the drain, healing whoever Meg touched simultaneously. They would die. They would hide the bodies and, you know, uh, then they would get another healer. And there are lots of healers around there and most of them don't like using their powers. However, one of the healers managed to get away and that's the one who was found, you know, lying on their lawn. Um, now, midway through the... A uh, faith healing contest after the Christian, you know, radical Christian group fails. They have the uh, Miracle Meg group try and do it. And, you know, Dr. Beverly, Allison, and Adam all find them down there, along with Victor, who has a face-off with Iblis. Uh, Victor gets seriously burned, though, and so they try and heal. Now, Miracle, they convince one of Allison's old friends from the school, who was about to get tricked into using up her life force to heal Victor. You know, it's a big show. To not to do it, and they explain what happened. But Miracle Meg is, uh, you know, unwilling to see everything fall apart. It turns out she actually really likes using her power because it feels really good. And so she decides that, you know, she's going to try and salvage this. She uses her power, and she essentially kills herself, like, aging herself to, like, 100 years old in order to heal Victor. Um, obviously, Miracle Dad is, in you know, 
informed of everything. And plot twist, though, it turns out, despite all the really odds, because magic isn't genetic, it's a bit of ancient magic got in you, particles got in you while you were in the womb or when you were developing as a kid, and then you get magical power. So getting uh, two mages in the same family, much less two mages who have the same power, is really, really rare. But during like this big old moment where everything goes wrong, um, Miracle Meg's sister ends up accidentally activating her powers and drain and aging herself to dust. So Miracle Dad lost both his daughters to his own greed, you know, come up and for the villain. Um and it's this big mystery at the end because the um strange person, Dr. Diabolary, is like his other personality, uh, Nicholas Fisk. He starts talking with his other friend who we met earlier about how, um, you know, this proves my theory, the third emergence. And the other guy's like, damn it. I didn't want you to be right, but I am right. Which means we've just killed a little girl proving it because they engineered this. They, uh, the, the other guy had worked as a P, uh, ended up inserting himself into the conflict using him acting as a PR booster to uh, push both the parties into this phase healing contest to get the ministry involved because the ministry had determined that they were going to stay neutral in this, which is one of the smartest moves I've ever seen a department do. It's like, yeah, so this uh, group of mages who, you know, have clearly using healing magic without some downsides, it might be a bit shifty, have decided to declare essentially the Christian church as a horrible organization that needs to be, you know, punished. Uh, what's your position on this? We are neutral. <laughs> we want no part in this. And it's like that we've had, we have had a lot of media problems. We want no part in this. And so they actually end up getting like put it, put as the judges in the contest, which is why the, uh, Allison and Dr. Diablery are there. It's all really interesting. I just like just how tired of everything Elizabeth is. Like, I want no part of this. <laughs> like, you know, we are neutral. We are completely neutral on this. <laughs> oh, that was fun. That was fun. So yeah, uh, in the end, you know, they get revealed as a bunch of murderers. The uh, Doctor Diablery's other side, uh, Victor, not Victor, uh, Nicholas Fisk takes the vampire dog because it's apparently really impressive that an animal hasn't become completely possessed and he just can't control his powers. He didn't mean to kill them. Uh, he ends up killing like two of the people in the van because they were two of the murders. Uh, which, you know, Tisha tipped you off that one of the guys was in a sealed van with only the dog. Again, it was one of those clues I just missed. Uh, I don't know what his plan is for the vampire dog. I don't know what this third emergence is. I don't know what their overall goal is. Why is he doing all this? Why is he, you know, being like this? I mean, he's obviously crossed several lines. He seemed to have guessed that the girl was going to do something like that and didn't take actions to stop her from literally... Uh, burning her own life force out from a 10-year-old to, like, a 100-year-old. So, you know, he has a kid's life on his you know, the blood of a child on his hands, which, yikes. Um, all in all, it's very, very weird. I, I like this. I like this world, though. It's just so interesting. Uh, the I love how, like, the shoot, shook, six, shook, six, 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 shook, 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 Sorry, I can't pronounce it. The fluidics, like, all have a singular name, uh, because they used to be the cells of an ancient. And they have, like, the Shuxus and the Shuxus. And it's like, we're the band. It's like, you know, like a, uh, like a talk show host fluidic. And it's just like, oh, I love that. Like, cute little things like that. It's like, what if magic got revealed? How would the world change? It's like, oh, it's changing in a lot of weird ways. I really like it. It's just a fun world that has some good comedy. I laughed several times throughout this, so it's pretty funny. All in all, yeah, you know, was really worth the time. I was really looking forward to this because I read uh, Differently Morphous back in 2019 when it came out, and I've just been waiting for this ever since. Definitely worth the wait. Would would very much recommend. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next up, you will... So, I'm going to be posting this on Monday night, Tuesday morning. You will be getting my review of the new Scream movie, which... Um, first impressions, I just got back from seeing it. Yeah, so way better than I thought it was going to be. You'll hear more about that on Tuesday. Or most of you are probably going to be watching this on the same day. I mean, listening to this on the same day. So, you know, see you then. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. And thank you for listening to The Dragon's Library. Please subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. The Dragon's Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week. And you can follow us on 
Twitter at dragon underscore library two. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. As always, thank you so much for all your support.